computer. Okay. All right. So I want to welcome everybody to the Embodied Chakra course overall as a series. I'm really excited to be bringing this out into the world. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. The main reason why this is out in the world is because it was requested. <laughs> this was not necessarily like in my plan of what I thought I was going to do for 2023 at all, to be honest with you. Um, this was requested actually through a chakra thing that I did a few months ago with Teresa and Katie, and there was another person there. And, um, and I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do this. That sounds good. And then I totally put it on the back burner and I was like, nah, no, I'm not going to do it. And then like two months later, like, uh, basically a spirit that I work with was like, Hey, you really need to put this out there into the world. And so here I am, this is what I'm doing. And so thank you for the push from you guys to actually do this. And, um, and I want to start off with kind of a general, like overview of kind of like my point in doing this course, because there really is a lot of information out there on the chakras. There's a lot of courses out there on the chakras, and there's a lot of great teachers out there who can teach the courses, right? And can teach you all this information. So why is this course different? This course is different because those clients that I work with, the people who I work with are honestly super intelligent. And I say that and I don't mean it in like a, like you guys know how to read. I can give you guys information. I can send you guys a list of some links, a document, a manual, and you guys can literally intellectualize all of this information. Okay. A root chakra is this, and it does this. And if I wear the color red, it's going to help my root chakra. That's great. Right? Like all of that information is great. But where embodiment comes in and where this course comes in is that how can we take all of that data? How can we take all of this information? How can we take what we know about the chakras, what we know about the energetic body or what even we don't know? And then how do we actually apply it into our life? And that's where embodiment comes in. And so I want us to kind of think about embodiment to me. This is my definition. This is my working definition, right? Would be knowledge plus experience. So having the knowledge and then taking that knowledge and saying, okay, like, what am I going to do with this now? Like, how is this actually going to help me? How is this going to benefit me and my life? Like, what's the purpose, right? It's kind of like if we were to work with, like, for example, if it's why I don't do readings, because a reading, I could sit here and give you a lot of information. I could be like, oh, Katie, you had a past life as Cleopatra and Teresa. You've been King Tut and Judy. You know, you were, you know, you built the pyramids, you know, like all of that information is cool and it's great. Sure. Right. But like, what, how is that going to help us? Like, how is that information actually doing us any good? How is the information about our chakras doing us any good? So this is where this comes in is that I kind of want to look at it as maybe like a practical, pragmatic approach, but I want to take it into a perspective of, like I said, other courses are teaching you this information. Cool. So I want to be the bridge between the information and like how you actually apply this into your life. So part of this is us understanding first, I am going to have to do a little bit of like the basic energetic body, energetic anatomy, because it's important to understand some of those things before we like dive into the practical pragmatic. Like sometimes we do have to have that foundation of knowledge, that foundation of understanding. I also know that we're all coming in at different places, right? So some of us have maybe done yoga for a while or meditated. Maybe we know what a chakra is, but you know, we don't know exactly what it is, right? And so starting to really define some of these terms, defining what I think modern spirituality might mean by them, but also understanding that chakras, this energetic anatomy, all of this stuff, this isn't new. We can call it woo-woo. We can call it like mystic. We can call it new age and that's totally fine. But if we looked into text and we looked thousands of years ago, this stuff has been out for a really, really long time. And I kind of want to start off with what if energy isn't real because we can't see it. Right. And so that's kind of like, like our energetic body is invisible or in my line of work, it's called the subtle body. So it's the body that we're not necessarily so like aware of. And if you looked up the subtle body, like on Google, you will find a lot of information about our energetic body. But let's go back to 
pre-technology back in the day, doctors, unless they like went in, right. And actually like, what is it called? Cadavers, anatomy. What is it? You know, when they like the like word dissecting? I, dissecting, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I'm like, yeah, think of the word of like the dead people, they cut them up, right. Until they opened them up, right. They had no idea what was going on in the organs that we had systems, right. So let's just bring this all into our physical body first, right. We have so many systems within us. We have our muscular system. We have our fascia. We have a respiratory system. We have our lymphatic system, our nervous system, right? We have so many systems that we actually can't see that nobody actually could see for a long, long time, right? Until x-rays, MRIs, et cetera, et cetera. Some people might've thought like doctors were crazy back then by thinking that, okay, well, we can't see all of this stuff in here. We still don't know how the brain works, right? So I say all of this is that what if we could understand that, yes, we don't maybe fully understand. We can't necessarily like, I can't show you right now, like a document, a piece of paper from a scholar that says like, these are the chakras and this is how, you know, we know that they exist because of this. Um, some things we just don't know yet. And some things we don't have access to that knowledge or the way to actually understand it. And so I like to start off with first is like, what if energy doesn't exist? Okay, fine. We do know that there are lots of things though that we can't see that do exist. One of them, my favorite is just the feeling of love, right? Like we cannot put love in a box. I can put it in some pizza and I can put in some chocolate and I can call it a day or I can hug my child. And you know, like that's as tangible as I can get, but we cannot see love in the body, but we know it exists. We feel it. And so what if maybe we just can't feel our energetic body yet, right? Maybe we just can't tap into that because we were never taught to. And that's kind of where I'm like headed next is we learned so much about our physical body. I remember being in health class and PE and we're learning. I remember having to learn the bones and the muscles and then being in yoga, having to know all of the muscles and all of this stuff. There's so much emphasis on our physical form, which is understandable, right? Like we're here. But at the same time, we don't have that awareness. We don't have that addition of the energetic body, of the subtle body, and understanding that these two things actually work in conjunction with each other instead of like separate. And so by understanding that our physical body is actually interacting with our energetic body constantly, we then can understand that our spiritual body, our subtle body is really like... It's, it is our physical body. It's just showing up in a different way. And so if we were to go into the energetic anatomy, so once again, we can understand we have a physical body, right? We have boundaries. Our boundaries are our skin, right? We have boundaries of our bones, where things end and where things don't. And we can really see them, right? Like you can see like where the edge of my clothes end, right? And where space is. Our energetic body though is a little bit different. Some of us do have the ability, the capacity, um, a gift, call it whatever you want to, to see the auric body or the subtle body. Now, here's where things get a little bit, if you look up the subtle body, and I had an image that I was going to show you guys, but every time I try to do a screen share on Zoom, it does not work. And so I don't want to like try to mess up with technology. And so just kind of like roll with me here. I can send a picture to you guys so that way you guys can see it later, but we don't have just our aura that's outside. And a lot of people talk about that, our aura, our aura, our aura. We also have an etheric body. We have an auric body. All We actually have lots of layers of our etheric body, just like we have lots of layers in our physical body. And just like I mentioned, our physical body is constantly in co-creation or in working in conjunction with our energetic body. So if we have an imbalance spiritually, or we have a balance physically, then we can know that like most likely it's going to be a mirror. So that's where that spiritual concept comes in of as above, so below. So once again, I'll repeat that because it's really important. If we have an imbalance in our energetic body, then most likely that imbalance, well not, no, most likely it is, that imbalance is going to show up through a physical manifestation. 
Okay. So let's talk about that really quick. What, like, how can that happen? So let's say you've had, um, I'll just use a, a, a good example, back pain. Not everyone's back pain is going to be from childhood trauma, but let's say you had childhood trauma and that's where your body was storing this, right? And so our body has this beautiful way of accessing information, of pulling information, but what we also need to acknowledge is that our root is not just like we have all of these different bodies, all of these different um, layers of our auric and our theric body. Our root chakra is not just in this one location. And this is something that you're not going to hear from other chakra teachers or other teachers who teach Eastern medicine, except for those who are in like India. The root chakra, the location of it physically, yes, the storage house, the center, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, is in the like perineum, like the pelvis area, but it extends down all the way to the feet. The reason why this is important is because our root chakra literally is the connection to our astral body, to our etheric body, and to everything else. So an imbalanced root chakra is causing us so much havoc in our um, physical body, in our etheric body, and just in our lives, because it literally is the foundation. It's like the seat. It's like the foundation of a home. And if you don't have a solid foundation of a home, then everything else that gets built on that is weak. It's unsupported. It doesn't have what it needs, right? And so... If we kind of head into that etheric body, right? So we're in that auric body. We're understanding that we have layers. We're now understanding that we have chakras. I am going to be talking, our course covers the first four chakras. So that's actually going to be the root, the uh, sacral, solar plexus, and the heart. I do not think it's appropriate to teach embodied chakra work with the uh, throat, the third eye, or the crown, uh, simply just because it has a lot of implications with mental health. And so I actually am going to be teaching that completely different, which so if you're wondering why I'm not offering the other chakras the same way, it's so for a very, very good reason. Um, and I'm happy to explore that with you on your own if you want me to. Um, and so what I want to talk about is that we have seven main chakras that align our energetic body. And once again, right now, what I'm talking to you about, I am simply talking to you about energetic anatomy. Take what you want from this, leave the rest. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all good. But in those, in that middle pillar, so in, um, in yoga and energetic anatomy, the spine is what is called the middle pillar. The middle pillar is a column that holds these chakras. These chakras are storage centers. They are like, I like to think of them as houses, but if we think about our body as a whole house, then a chakra would just be a room. However, the chakras are so big, they're like a house in a house, if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so, um, and so hold on, let me check my notes really quick because I teach what I have written down, but then I also channel information and then that gets like really clouded. So let me make sure that I'm on track here. Are we all understanding what I'm saying so far? Just understanding the differentiation between the energetic body, understanding that the energetic body does connect with the physical body. We're on, we're on board here. Okay. All right. So the, all of these storage centers, ideally, right. They are functioning. They are stable. And because of that, our physical form, everything is working right. We can also think about that middle pillar and that kind of like a pipeline. And this is my favorite analogy, is that if we were to think about that pipeline like a hose, and if you were to get a kink in a hose, water is not going to be moving freely through that hose anymore, right? It stops. What happens with our energetic body is not necessarily a kink. But instead of it going straight, sometimes things kind of get offline. And so it's almost like it gets like, so it took like a bypass or it took a turn. And we have to like guide that chakra or guide that inner energy center like back into the center. And that's simply just for stability. That chakra might need more work on top of that. 
However, what I want to just really get into your attention is that we have these centers, you know, they're all in the center and they all have particular specific functions. So today we are talking about the root chakra while understanding that we are engaging with a whole entire chakra system. Um, in Eastern medicine, they would say there are over thousands of chakras within our bodies. So that includes the hands, the feet, like the ears, like basically everything is a chakra or a storage center or a container. Um, however, it is the main seven that are going to get knocked off so much by things such as trauma, um, things such as imbalance or like we're talking with a root chakra, which is all about security and stability. So if we were to think about a root, literally like the root of a tree, what a root needs in order for it to be stable, right? It needs to have solid soil. It needs to have water. It needs to have some sun. There are some things that have to happen in order for this root to plant, to grow, to nourish, to flourish. The same for us. We need more than just our roots, right? We also need our own version of what a tree does, right? So like, yeah, we need food and water. But outside of that, we need security. We need stability in our lives. We need consistency in our lives. We need to feel safe in our life. When we don't, those messages are all getting stored within our root chakra. And so I want to talk about how our chakras get impacted by trauma. And because this is another reason why I'm wanting to offer this course is that those of you, I know that you guys all work with me, um, but for those of you who are watching, you know, at a later time, healing from trauma is such a huge passion of mine. Like it is like, it is something that I feel like I am I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to just spread the word of how to heal from trauma because it was such an arduous journey for me. And I feel like things could have been a lot easier with the right support or the different information out there. And I say that because our trauma, when we can understand how it not only impacts like our, our daily life, but it impacts our energy centers, how it impacts our chakras. When we actually understand that and we can acknowledge it, then we can actually heal it. We can't heal something if we don't know kind of the origin or why it exists, right? And so if we were to think about, I, I hate to like put the, like a, like a, a negative example out there. So I'm not going to say like any one person, but just imagine someone being in a car crash, like a high speed car crash, glass everywhere, right? Shattered everywhere. There's glass now in this person's skin, right? Or even like some sort of like an explosion, right? Like I'm sure you've seen some sort of a movie where there's been like glass or like debris in the skin. Let's think about that car crash, that high speed explosion or crash, whatever that was as a traumatic experience. Okay. So now your chakra, your energetic body now has these shards of glass, of debris from the traumatic experience. In order for us to heal, we have to be able to tend to our wounds. We literally have to be able to take out all of these glass shards. These glass shards are not just our trauma. They are society's beliefs. They are our parents' words that they told us about security, about safety, about love, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, trauma is a natural part of, of our life. Um, I actually worked with trauma in a completely different way, like in a spiritual way. And it was a very beautiful experience. And what I discovered and what I learned is that we as humans and just beings here, like the plants and all of that stuff, we are actually made to deal with trauma. But I want to be really clear. We're made to deal with natural trauma. When I say natural trauma, I mean the death of somebody. I mean the traumatic experience that our body goes through whenever we have a child. That's trauma, right? Even the ending of a relationship, our bodies actually know how to process that. It was made to survive. 
So if it was made to survive and it was made to be resilient, what it is not made to do is to handle the abuse of, uh, on the hands from somebody else. It, it is not meant to balance and heal on its own and naturally survive and thrive when it has been taken advantage of or when it has been violated. And so our root chakra out of all of our chakras gets so significantly impacted by trauma, which is, which is why I'm pausing to talk about it because every single person in this group right here has experienced trauma and I'm not calling anybody out, right? We all have experienced trauma, big T's, small T's. I don't care what you call them. We all have had trauma. And if we can understand that we've all had trauma, then we can understand that our energetic body has then kind of absorbed that. And then we can begin to work with it, right? Nothing can happen if we can't acknowledge, or this is where information comes in, right? If we don't know how trauma is impacting our energetic body, because we're only hearing about how trauma is impacting our nervous system, how trauma is impacting our brain, how trauma is impacting our chronic pain, and all of that has its place. But the true healing is not going to come until we start addressing like the other huge aspect of ourselves, which is the spiritual self, which is the energetic self. So if we were to go into the root chakra, into the basics, into like understanding all of that, right? Understanding our energetic body, understanding how trauma significantly impacts the root, how the root chakra is not just in one place, but it extends all the way down into the feet. I want us to bring this information as we kind of dive into the more like informational side of things, right? Like a root chakra is this and it does this. But like I said, I'm not, what you're not going to find in this class tonight is me going through the manual word by word. Cause like I said, you guys are smart. You guys can do that. What I want to offer you guys is different information, information that supplements all of that stuff. Okay, and that maybe embodies it a little bit more than just intellectual. However, to talk about the root chakra, we've already talked about the location. Okay. And so, you know, modern day world, we're going to be looking at the root chakra, pelvic floor. And um, that's also going to be, um, if we think about all of the organs that are in the root chakra, and not only that, but if we think about all of the muscles, right, in our legs and our knees and our feet and our ankles, then we can start to understand that if we have an imbalance in our root chakra, then some of our issues with our organs. So let's think of digestive issues as females, issues with our periods, issues with menopause, um, sexual dysfunction for men. Um, I'm trying to think of just like a bunch of um, even the um, inability to have children, not based on biological means, but literally like a spiritual, like needing some healing. There are so many things that our root chakra governs that our root chakra holds on to. Like when I say like, it is the foundation, it is the base. Like it is like, it is the mama, <laughs> you know, like that phrase, like if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. If the root chakra is not happy, nothing else is happy. Nothing else is going to be working well. And so um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I'll find that whenever people sign up for courses with me, that it's not like you guys are probably getting into a lot of root chakra work in your own inner work, not even realizing it. I, cause I know it's showing up for me heavily this month. I'm like, okay, I'm also doing my journal prompts. I'm also doing the root chakra meditation because this does bring up a lot, a lot of stuff because this stuff is from our childhood. <laughs> our root chakra began at our childhood. So if we were to think about our roots, if you were to think about your roots, were you nurtured appropriately? Did you receive the sun, the, the safety, the security that you needed for those roots to be so stable that like you could grow up and be this healthy whole human being? It is so rare, unfortunately 
that people are growing up as mature, responsible adults with not having that unnatural trauma, right? I do want to make, there is the difference. Our bodies are wired for trauma, for resilience, not for a natural trauma, okay? And so when or if we have experienced trauma, um, specifically related to those areas, so I'm talking about sexual trauma here, our whole entire belief system has now been knocked the fuck off. It is not just we have an imbalance in our root chakra. It's not just that we have digestive issues and we have IBS and sometimes we have to take, you know, like laxatives or whatever it is. It's so much more than this because now our root chakra, our sense of safety, of survival, of security, of our feeling like that we belong in this world has now been knocked off. So now all of our beliefs that we had about the world being safe, about other people being safe, about us being safe in our own body, it's all gone. So if you have ever felt <laughs> disconnected from yourself, if you ever felt disconnected from other people, um, it's, it's probably because like of a root chakra imbalance, of an imbalance that perhaps happened at a younger age right? And not all of us, it was like early childhood, right? But um, the root chakra is something that no matter how enlightened, how awakened, how much work that you've done, there is still work to be done with the root chakra. It's almost like if I were to go outside, my, my husband loves to garden. For me, gardening is not my thing, but I'm like, okay, we're done. It's like, no, I can, I can, I can pull weeds today. I can do this. I'm like, okay, <laughs> like there's always something to do, right? There's always something that we can uncover or excavate or lean a little bit into. And so back to, I'm kind of hopping over onto like several ponds here, but back to like the physical part of our root chakra. So I'm wearing the color red. <laughs> and so the root chakra, um, the whole color of the root chakra is red. It's very earthy tones. It's the browns. And so I say that in that an easy way for us to connect to the root chakra. And I want to say this, we can connect to the root chakra in a lot of ways, but can we do it with intention? right? I can wear red, right? I have a red shirt. I have red pants. I call them my power pants. If you've ever seen my red yoga pants, then you're, you're a lucky person. <laughs> uh, no. And so what I'm saying is that we can do all of these things, right? Like I can wear this red shirt, but if I'm not doing this with the intention to kind of like, Oh, Hey, root shocker, I'm giving you some attention today. Like I'm wearing this to balance you out. Right. Or I'm like, or, Hey, like, I feel like I might need a little power. I need a little, might need a little earth. So we're bringing some awareness or bringing some intention into some of the things that we're doing. Right. So another thing that our root chakra loves. Okay. So think about if root chakra is all about earth, it's our connection to earth then the foods that their root chakra is really going to love is anything that was in the earth. So root vegetables, literally I'm like carrots, parsnips, um, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, beets are fantastic. So anything that literally like grew from like, especially the ones that have to stay underneath like onions, garlic, like all of that stuff, our root chakra really, really loves that. On top of that, our bodies also appreciate kind of being nurtured through the earth, through the foods. There are books, there are courses, <laughs> there are trainings out there that are literally like just chakra and food period. So like I could have a whole discussion on foods for the chakras or whatever, but I do want to give you more of like a basic understanding that our, the foods that we put into our bodies, right. Um, we're meaning really everything that we are engaging with has some sort of interaction with us, but we can actually do a lot to balance our root chakra. And it doesn't have to be this huge inner work, shadow work, crying on the floor, you know, like my Scorpio rebirth death type of person. You know what I mean? Like our root chakra throughout the times and we're not necessarily needing to do that inner work, we can say, all right, all right, you know what? I'm feeling a little ungrounded today. 
Um, I think some root vegetables or root vegetable soup is going to be really beneficial or maybe some red pants or whatever it is, right? So we can take that, the intellectual, the data, the information that you guys have in your manual about the physical characteristics of the root chakra, like how, how it can manifest or how it like shows up. These are the ways, these are just small ways, right? That we can pull in the root chakra. We can start to understand it a little bit more. We can also start to balance it out a little bit more. Like I said, all courses are going to be going over that though. <laughs> like I, like there's so much wealth of information. What I want to talk to you guys about is that how do we actually take all of this outside of the food, outside of the colors, right? Outside of understanding the digestive issues is that how do we actually heal our root chakra? How do we actually offer safety, security? How do we offer consistency to our root chakra when we've had trauma or whenever it's imbalanced in the first place? What I would say is the first thing is for us, it is really, really important is to redefine self-care. You're going to notice I did not say self-care because and you, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in this class and also in our other master classes is that we have to start defining the words that we use for ourselves. So self-care. We can go on Instagram. Um, and I say that because the majority of us in this um, class like is, you know, heavily on Instagram. Um, and we can find all of these things about self-care, right? Um for the longest time, it was, you know, bubble baths and, you know, or like, you know, what do you do for self-care and it's massage, you're getting your nails done. All of that stuff is self-care. And I'm not discounting any of that. I went to the spa on Saturday. That was like my early mother's day present. That was hundred percent hashtag self-care, like, you know, in so many ways. So those have spaces, but however, I can't do that every day. I can't go to Olympus spa and hang out naked every day and go spend eight hours by myself in a salt and charcoal room. You know, um, as much as Teresa might love it, she'd, I know, like, I'm sure she'd love to get a massage every day, <laughs> you know, or like, you know, and as much as we maybe even want to do a bubble bath every day, sometimes we actually don't have time for that. Like, let's be honest, right? Like sometimes our self-care, like, maybe the reason why we're not doing our self-care is because we've put this idea on it. And sometimes it like, it takes too much time, right? Like, like at the end of the day, really, what do you have time for? How do you define self-care? So I want to take a few moments. It's, it looks like you guys all have some paper and pen. I want you, and even if you don't have a piece of paper and a pen, you can just like, you know, kind of explore it mentally. But I want you just to begin to think about like, how do you take care of yourself? And I want you to just start to list it out. This is not something that we need to discuss, um, at least in this class. We do have a 15-minute Q&A section um, at the end. So if you want to discuss something that is more personal, that would be the time. But I just want you just to feel free to explore. I want you to write down a few things about your self-care routine. And I'm going to give you like maybe a minute and a half for this activity. I'm going to check you guys and see if we might need to shift things around though. And actually what I'd love to do is if you want to type in a response, so a way that you give yourself self-care, feel free to, um, don't feel like you have to at all. Um, but I think it might be a good way for us to kind of tie things together. Okay. So we have music. Yes. I love music for self-care. And that's one that I don't think about very often. Like, it's like, I always have it, but I don't think about music. So I love that you brought that up. Yeah, I imagine combing the day out of my hair. I love that. Incense candles, easy access aromatherapy. Yeah, yeah. So all of these things are like, are great. 
Yeah, I love it. Okay, so we have some tools. So first off, it's great that we have tools for self-care, right? Not everybody does, or maybe not everyone is aware of it. My question is, what does self-care look like though outside of, so like, and yours, Katie, is a little bit different because yours isn't like a, a material thing, right? Like music or, you know, like Teresa mentioned incense and candles, um, you know, but without that, how can you define self-care? What do you offer? And I'll, I'll rephrase it. How, what does your self-care look like without maybe some like material things? And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just like, like, how can we redefine our self-care? And I'll give you an example. So saying no, creating a boundary with somebody, right? Like, um, I was asked by somebody locally if I, um, they had some space available and they were like, oh, um, do you want to rent out my space and you can teach yoga and all this other kind of stuff. And um, like, yeah, that'd be a great, great opportunity, but no, like, that's not actually like, I'm not interested in doing that right now. That is self-care, right? That's redefining self-care because I'm figuring out, you know what? Like, no, that's not really for me right now. So now I want us to think about our self-care outside of the the things that we maybe like go to or grasp I guess what I'm trying to say is like let, let's think about this a little bit bigger let's explore it so feel free to write this out feel free to type it into the chat and let me know what that might look like for you Some things that I wrote down as I was preparing for this class was I wrote down, um, you know, often those of us who have imbalanced root chakras, we are people pleasers, <laughs> we're perfectionists. And so if we've thought about how we can redefine our self-care, how can we redefine our self-care around people pleasing? How can we redefine our self-care around being a perfectionist, right? Let's see what we have. Something new I've learned recently is the way I talk to myself, being kinder. Yes, I give my attention to beauty in the natural world and express gratitude. Yes, yes, I love it. Yeah, so I would say that as far as the root chakra goes in general, what the root chakra really enjoys is the word no. And I don't know if you've ever really experienced like to really, really say no. <laughs> sometimes it's really hard. Like it's hard to say no to my kids. Like sometimes Zoe comes up to me. She's so cute. Mama, can I please have another cookie? You know, and I'm just like, oh, it's not going to do anything, you know, but like, no, I need, I need boundaries, right? Like she needs boundaries. They're all need boundaries. Anyways, our root chakra also enjoys boundaries. If we can think about why our root chakra got in balance in the first place, it was because some part of our boundaries got violated. Some part of our boundaries were knocked off. So by us putting out boundaries by saying no to things, because once again, most of us who have a root chakra imbalance are going to be outputting our energy elsewhere. We are not going to be putting that energy back into the root chakra. We are depleted so depleted in the root chakra, but we are continually pouring out of an empty vessel simply because that we feel like that is self-care. So let's once again, redefine self-care. Self-care is about us. So if we think that we are caring about ourselves by people pleasing, we're very misguided, right? If we think that we are Caring for ourselves through perfectionism, that's also misguided because we've now put ourselves in a box and we've now said, no, who you are is not good enough. And guess what? We have heard that message our whole entire life. So part of this is redefining, just like you said, Teresa, how we speak to ourselves and not just how we speak to ourselves, but what we're thinking. This, guys, is the hardest, hardest to work with. And on top of that, what is so kind of bizarre is that it is the furthest from our root chakra, right? We spend so much time up in here, yet we have a whole energetic body that literally connects us to the earth, and we're spending our time up here. 
And there's a, um, there's a really great coach and I don't, I don't remember what her name was, but she's, she said, do not believe anything that your mind tells you in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I started to like, I don't believe my mind. I'm trying not to believe my mind, period. Cause my mind tells me a lot of lies. It tells me a lot of stories. My brain loves stories, loves, oh, I this person wrote me this email and they must have been thinking this and this and this and this and that, you know, my anxiety, whatever, like trails off. Like, no, right? So our root chakra, once again, it needs no's. It needs boundaries. It needs us, us to redefine our self-care. I'm, I'm hopping onto another boat, but it's, it's a relevant path that we're on is that in relation to the root chakra, this is something else that other people aren't talking about. There is archetypes that we can work with within the root chakra. Very, um, validated. The root chakra archetype is the victim. Um, and I say validated and I, and I, um, and I think it's really important that we understand that there's actually nothing, and I'm going to mean this, nothing wrong with being a victim. We are a victim because we have been victimized. It is society and cultures, beliefs, expectations that don't be a victim. Don't be, a, don't play the victim. When we can't acknowledge what we've been through, then we will always, always play the victim. So where does this come into play with the root chakra? Okay. The root chakra, we've been traumatized. It's now off balance, right? And this could be trauma. This could be like, for example, I had a micro trauma the other day. Like this is like, and this is like nothing like huge, but it knocked me off. I am desperately like clinging to my, my resources. I, I, I'm not desperately, uh, maybe, maybe Sunday I was desperately clinging, <laughs> um, but what I want to say is that if we were to really engage with our root chakra in a different way, we could hold a lot more compassion for ourselves. Compassion in us being a victim. Compassion in the fact that we might have to acknowledge and sit in a victim role for some time. I got to be honest with you. I, I, I did. I sat in my victim role in early on in my trauma. And I got to be honest with you. It was not a pretty season. <laughs> like I, it was not, it was a huge healing. It was a huge release. And it was me letting everybody know how much they failed me basically throughout my whole life. Like it was a really, really tough season. So I say that is that being a victim is not easy. Sitting in your victimhood is not easy. And it actually, I think it takes it, it actually brings me tears. It takes a huge amount of courage to sit in your victimhood. But the goal of our life is to never stay stagnant, is to never stay like stuck in that space. So be the victim because you were the victim. Be the victim and feel everything that you need to feel so you can move forward to the healthy archetype of the of the root chakra, which is guess what? The survivor. <laughs> and actually the survivor archetype, you won't find anywhere else. Cause I, I, that's something that I've, I've discovered is that I think that with every corrupted archetype, such as a victim can, can become corrupted is that we also have the, like, that's the shadow side, right? We also have the light side or the yin and the yang, which is a survivor. So once we begin to acknowledge, work with the root chakra, embody the root chakra, then <laughs> we get to become a survivor. We get to become a survivor of that trauma. We get to become a survivor of our stuff. And a survivor and a victim are two completely different categories. In a Venn diagram, yes, there are some similarities, right? I will always be a victim of my past and my childhood trauma but I am a survivor of that, right? And so whenever we can work with our root chakra in this way, we begin to alchemize our pain. We begin to alchemize our shit, honestly, into something that is powerful. Because here I am talking about how the root chakra, it is fragile. But let me be clear, fragile does not mean that it's not powerful. It is so powerful. 
when your root chakra is in balance and we have a strong energetic container, then it can actually take all of this stuff and then transform it. It's literally like, like alchemy is like the word of the year for me. It is literally like taking all of your stuff and it's saying, guess what? There's power here. When I say power, I'm going to say like for me, where my survivor or where my archetype or that power comes in is it comes in through my story. I get to share my story. I have the opportunity to share my story that gets to help people. That's power. I'm not talking about power. Like I'm reigning around my town of Anacortes and a crown and I got a like thing on. I'm like, no, 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 you know, like King Charles and like that. No, I'm talking about the power that I have that I'm now no longer like governed by my trauma. And I now get to alchemize all of that. And then I get to help people who went through something similar. Now that's my path. That's my power, right? That's how I alchemized my victim into a survivor. Your journey is probably gonna be a lot different. But I will say is that it is your story that has power. And it's your story that we can share that can actually strengthen our root chakra and can strengthen our whole entire system because we've now acknowledged what brought us to that place in the first place. A lot of us experience trauma and there's a lot of shame surrounding trauma. Shame silences everything. Shame is like I don't know. I, 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 I honestly think shame, I, I know, I know people say like jealousy or greed is like the, um, like the lowest vibrational energy. And I'm, I'm, I disagree. I'm going to say shame is because what I've learned also from Dr. Brene Brown is that shame is not a legitimate emotion. Shame is created from somebody else, not taking responsibility for something that they should have. So what we are left with is a world and a society and a culture that literally perpetuates trauma. It perpetuates disconnection. It's going to perpetuate this until the end of time. I do think our world is getting better. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that we're like, everything is like headed for like the world end or the apocalypse, but I don't, trauma is not going to end. It's just not disconnection is what like is the uh, disconnection is what happens whenever we sorry trauma is what happens when we're disconnected from ourselves and that disconnect literally creates the belief of I don't belong here. I don't have a purpose in this world. Why am I even here in the first place? Um, the, or even let's go into the, maybe you're not in that, and that pool right now. But what I will say is that most of us are in the pool of not wanting to be seen, not wanting to be heard, scared of being seen, scared of being heard, scared of sharing our stuff. I, I went through a traumatic experience eight years ago, and I've just posted about it online for the first time, I think like three months ago. And so if we are to understand that the world is going to be constantly telling us, first off, this is how you do things. This is how it rolls. And this is how it impacts you. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. My question is, is that what if that isn't true? And how can we start to, I would say, I don't want to mute society or mute culture because it has its place, but I do kind of want to like turn down the volume a bit because we're relying so much on other people or other like doctors, healers, like whatever it is, right. To, to basically work through this stuff. But what I want to say is that we have the ability to tune into our root chakra and ask it questions and get answers. We have the ability to speak to our bodies, to acknowledge things in our bodies. 
but we have to allow that bridge to be open. Part of that bridge being open is simply you being open to it. Like you being open to the fact like, hey, maybe I can talk to parts of my body like I can talk to another person. And then maybe being open that there might be a response. Now, all of you have worked with me in some sort of capacity. And so I know that all of you are aware of the power and actually how self-inquiry works, right? Like I know that all of you have experienced picking up information from your body and then understanding it, right? So how can we do that though outside of, let's say, a healing session with me or a session with a therapist? The reason why I say this is because not that there's anything wrong with our, with our therapy sessions, with our healing sessions. Like I'm so, so grateful that all of that resource is there, but when we're working with a therapist, we're working with a healer, we're working with whoever, whoever is on our support team. Most of the time it's like an hour at a time, right? So maybe an hour a day, maybe an hour a week, maybe an hour every five, six weeks. What are we doing in the rest of those hours? How are we connecting to our bodies? And I don't want to say without like relying on somebody else because there's nothing wrong with needing support, right? But how can we begin to communicate to our bodies on our own? And so this is kind of like leading into some of these, the journal prompts and some of the questions that I wrote out in the manual. All of that stuff is optional. Like you don't have to like do it. However, those, there are journal questions specifically designed to be somatic focused that are self-inquiry based, which means that we're not tapping into what our brain thinks. We're not asking, hey, brain, like I'm trying to think of one of the questions. I had it popped up here earlier, but all right, like, like, hey, brain. How can I bring in more intention to my grounding activities? Our brain does not care. Our brain is really, really good at taking information, storing it, and then telling you what to do with it in that way, right? Like, hey, you need to turn right here. You need to take a left. It's great with that type of stuff. When it comes to like like relationships and it comes to things that are like complex in that way, like our bodies are the ones that we want to be interacting with. So using those journal prompts, can help you to connect a little bit deeper to that consciousness of your body, but also to explore some ways that you can communicate to your root chakra. And so one of the questions that I'm going to ask you that's not in the manual that I want you just to kind of think about, feel free to um, put it in the chat. What are the daily activities that you are doing that benefit my root chakra in this world? So what are the daily activities that you are doing that benefit your root chakra? And I also put slash existence in this world because sometimes perhaps we can't gather into that root chakra part, right? So what are we doing to benefit our existence to our life, right? How are we giving to ourselves and perhaps maybe others? And then a follow-up question is going to bring, how can you bring more intention into those activities? And so once again, we can do a lot of things. I can, I can do, I, I can have a spiritual healing session with somebody, but with no intention, it's sometimes it's just going to be like empty words, right? Um, I can go through my house and I can, you know, like, clean or something, you know, but if I have intention, I'm like, oh, I'm going to clean. And I want my husband to, you know, like come home to a nice kitchen or something like that. There's a different intention. There's more heart. There's more of you in that. And so, you know, and if you're not doing something that benefits your root chakra, what is something that you can do that can benefit your root chakra that isn't food or color, (laughs) or, you know, the, what everybody else is talking about, right? Okay. All right. So we have something making solid plans for future changes. This is new and positive because I didn't believe it was possible until recently. 
Yes. Yes. And, and it makes so much sense. You need to have like a stable root, a stable foundation to even make plans for the future. Right? Like that's awesome. Yes. Yoga Nidra and spiritual bath. So the intention of realizing and believing I'm safe. Katie, I love this because our self-care, the other thing that I forgot to mention is that when we are working on redefining our self-care, we have to do things that work for us, right? So for me and Katie and I, we've talked about this, spiritual baths work for us. I, I have a spiritual bath that's been soaking on my, uh, soaking in the sun for two days now. Like it is my, it works for me, right? Yoga, it works for me. There's certain things that work and we have to understand that there are going to be things that work for you and we need those things. So I love that. And, and believing that you're safe. So that intention is fantastic. So I, I'm, I love that. Judy, did you want to put on anything in the chat? No. Okay. No worries. Okay. All right. So we have about four minutes left. I'm going to take a look at my notes and I'm going to make sure I covered everything because I hopped all over the place like I typically do. Um, so the only thing that I would say that that to kind of add or before like kind of closing this out before we head to the Q&A is to talk about the values of the root chakra, like what's important to a root chakra. And I've mentioned them some to you, but I want us to think about this like that wheel of life or a wheel, right? And how there's can be different categories. And I want you to kind of think about as I am like offering you these values, if you were to think about like on a scale, like where you would be, right? Like, so for example, one of the values of the root chakra is stability. So like where you are at currently, right? Like, and this is, you know, like, you know, are, how stable are you, right? Um, safety, how safe, and it's not how safe are you, it's how safe do you feel? Because how safe we are and how we feel are completely different right? We might be completely safe. I'm completely safe in my house, but if I'm going through a trigger, I'm no longer feel safe in my body or even in my house sometimes, right? Security. Do you feel secure within yourself? I would say security would also go in a little bit with confidence, but confidence is definitely a solar plexus uh, characteristic, but there is some of that um, in there. The other ones, so those values, those are the ones that you're going to kind of see in the manual. The ones that like aren't really out there are ones that I, that I think are important values of the root chakra, which are consistency. So we were to think about having something that is a foundation or having something that is solid. One time most likely is not going to do it. Unfortunately, all of the baby weight that I gained <laughs> from my last pregnancy did not disappear from one time that I worked out. I am now working out consistently for six weeks and I'm still like halfway there, right? So consistency is so important for the root chakra. You consistent in your boundary setting, right? Your consistency in um, your self-care practices, right? Your consistency in how you're thinking or how you're changing and all that kind of stuff. The other thing that the root chakra really values is effort. And I say this is because we can int intellectualize all of this information. And I mentioned this earlier, but embodiment only comes through effort. We can think about baking a cake. We can think about drinking water. I'm still, I'm not drinking water the cake didn't get baked, right? And so understanding that we have to have an effort. There's something that we have to actually like physically put out there into the world. So the root chakra, once again, really values effort. And then this is going to be really contradictory. And I'm okay with that because life is contradictory. It's full of spectrums. The root chakra values out of, I would say all of that, I would say safety would be probably number one, but I'd say number two would be rest. So I know I just said effort, do things, <laughs> but what if some of your effort was in resting? Because a lot of us actually have to put a lot of effort into resting. It took me two hours 
two hours of me being at the spa and this like salt charcoal room to finally like get into like somewhat of a like a balanced state right so like it is going to take time our bodies need rest our root chakra needs rest that is the only way that we can heal so i talked a lot <laughs> about some things around the root chakra um I am just going to close this up really quick before I pause the recording. Um, I just want to thank all of you so much for being here, for listening, for following through my constant, like, you know, pond jumping. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll head to our Q&A.